Greetings friends. Welcome to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. We thank you for taking time every busy day to watch our videos and we do pray that our studies in the Word of God and our studies in history be a blessing to those who are following along. We thank you those of you that take the time to comment our videos and we also appreciate you those of you that are giving our videos likes. Friends help us spread the truth. Help it get to others. We need your likes. We need the likes on the videos that people might be able to see them. That uh, YouTube makes them more available the more likes they get. We are in the 16th century where you're looking again at the book of Martyr's Mirror. And as you may note, as we move along, as we move farther up in time here, where there's more that we can give to you because there's much more available. Uh, more records were available. Uh, whereas in the early centuries so much was destroyed, so much was lost, that there's not as much information available about the saints, about their stand for the faith, and about the, their, uh, a, lot of, a lot of records for their deaths, their persecution, because Rome kept diligent records about the killing and the murdering and the persecuting of the saints. But here as we continue in this, and kind of got caught in the middle of this last time. Time just uh, uh, got away from us. But we spoke of in the year 1521 of one Ludv uh, Ludvis Weiss, uh, Valencia, as he wrote about the remarks of Augustine and others as regards believer's baptism, and that being from the first book of the City of God and 20th ch uh, 27th chapter of Augustine, and as we look at these things here and we see the comments and the things that are given to us in the book Martyr's Mirror that declare unto us of the history of the faith, the history of believers' baptism and those who stood for it, that, that taught it, lived for it, and died for it, and their persecution. And uh, we have not in this tried to, there's... Uh, all kinds of writing on the death and the murder of these people, their persecution, their martyrdom. Uh, we've got Fox's Book of Martyrs. we got over here, uh, Martyr's Mirror over here on the shelf. And uh, But we're primarily trying to give you their doctrinal stand, what these people believe, and also at times what Catholicism itself had to say about them, that how that they were a godly people who lived godly lives, and the only thing truly that Catholicism had against them was that they refused to honor Catholicism as the one true church, the so-called universal church. So-called, uh, you know, from the beginning in the early days, it was the universal visible church. And then when Martin Luther came out, and he and others that came out of Catholicism had to have their authority somehow, so they it began to be taught as a universal invisible church. That, that authority connects us all, and we're all connected to the same body, a universal uh, invisible body or universal invisible church. And my friends, the church is not an invisible church. It's not a universal church. And there's not, and there's not a single church, but there are many churches. In the book of Revelation, we see seven letters to seven distinct churches in history. There are many other churches recorded in the Bible. History tells us of many churches. There are many churches today. We have them on our corner, it seems. But those who do not hold to believers' baptism and practice believers' baptism, my friends, are not true churches. They're not churches of the Lord. They don't hold to the doctrine of the Word of God. And we would have you to understand that. And that believer's baptism is not something new. Started by people in, well, the 16th century or 17th century. But it goes all the way back to the time of Christ, yea, even to John the Baptist. Now, let's continue with this. From the book Martyrs of Miriam, we continue to read. It says, before we leave this, we would state that mention is made in this century not only of the Waldenses, but also of certain churches of, in Thessalonica, in Greece, which are declared to have remained unchanged in faith from the time of Christ, and to agree in faith and practice with the Anabaptist churches in Switzerland, 
I will quote the account verbatim, which I have found in, a reg in, which I found in regard to this, in a certain tract titled, The Spectacles by Which Anabaptists of One Faith May See, etc., by a Lover of the Truth. J.S. Printed at Harlem by Hans Purchaser, Van Hushbush. Worshippers. And again, I'm probably not pronouncing that right. It's 1630 when that was published, apparently. Uh, but it, this is what is found therein. In the preface, page 10, we read, Since my beloved, all the truly pious have a sincere joy and the greatest delight to know that many pious people are found upon earth, it was, or it has seemed good to me to acquaint you with a brief testimony that has fallen into my hands. How in the year 1540 or a little before certain persons were brought captive by the Turks from Moravia to Thessalonica in Turkey and sold as slaves which slaves there became acquainted with the Thessalonian Christians Observing their life and conversation, they said to these Thessalonians that in Moravia there lived a people who were like them in life and conversion and were called Anabaptists, which kindled in, their, which kindled in the Thessalonians a zeal to examine the truth of the matter, and it further happened as the testimony states, etc., Besides what we have noted concerning the churches in Thessalonica, Balthazar Ladius gives this account. We will first speak of the Greek churches who, in great numbers, are under the dominion of the Grand Turk, for, it, for in the city of Thessalonica, by Turks now called Solonic, the Christians, or Greeks, have more than 30 churches, while the Turks, on the other hand, have only one, or have only three. And so it is in other places in the vicinity. These churches do not recognize the Pope as the general head of the church. This appears from the book of Nilus. Uh, on page 42, the book referred to above, we read brief account how through some Moravians who had been captured by the Turks and had come to Thessalonica in Turkey, the Christians at Thessalonica obtained information that in Moravia there lived fellow believers of theirs who were there called Anabaptists. And how, in order to ascertain the truth of the matter, they sent three of their brethren to Moravia in Germany. I, the undersigned, testify that in Moravia there lived with me for the space of three years a man or of our brethren, about a hundred years old, named Leonard Kenar who related to me that in his time, when he was a servant in the com common house of the common church of puppets under the Stuart Hans Hermann, three brethren of the church of Thessalonica were sent to Germany to inquire after their fellow believers, who, as they had learned from prisoners, as stated above, were living in Moravia. They first came to Nicholsburg on the frontier of Hungary, where they went to a priest and inquired after these people. He entered a carriage and rode with these three men to Perzram, to those who there called Hutterites, and in the Netherlands, Moravians, having well examined 
their life and conversation, they discussed with them in the Latin language in which they were well versed, all the articles of the faith, but found that in three principal articles they did not accord, namely first in shunning, as this article was maintained by the Hutterites, second in the community of goods, which virtually consists with them more in dominion and servitude, than in equity. Thirdly, that they withhold from those who fall away from their communion and leave them to leave them the property which they brought in, on account of which these three men parted from them with tears in their eyes because they had performed such a difficult and laborious journey in vain. Or at least that's what it seems at this point. But we read on. The same priest then brought them, uh, them in some place, Prozrom, to the Schweitzer Church, who derived their name from Hans Schweitzer, who through one of their brethren named John Peck, who with Hans Former, of the twelve other persons, had lain in prison for nine years, in the castle of Parsoon on the Dun Dundu Dumbi in Baravia for the testimony of the faith, discussed in Latin all the articles of their faith, they agreed well in all points, and on account of which they being mutually filled with great joy, <coughs> acknowledged each other as dear brethren and in token thereof, commemorated together the Lord's Supper with great gladness, confessing themselves the true church of God. They stated further that the church of God at Thessalonica had remained unchanged in faith from the time of the apostles, and they still preserved in good condition the letters which the Apostle Paul wrote to them with his own hands. Now imagine that. And this is in the, uh, the 16th century. And it, it was their witness that they still had in good condition the actual letters of Paul. And this is one of the reasons why, too, brethren, I believe that uh, those churches over there, those monasteries over there, the ones under the control of Rome, under the control of the Greek church, under the control of the Latin church, those uh, the Eastern church, and those four groups, and the others, even, in, even into Russia, I believe that there are ancient manuscripts which they are keeping, which they are not presenting to the general public and to the scholars, even of our days, and the learned men, and they will not bring them forth. They know of at least a thousand or more that's in that monastery in Egypt that they can't look at. But why would they hold them back? Because they know what they say. And I do believe firmly that they would agree with the traditional text which would exalt the King James Bible even higher as the true word of God and it would condemn all modern texts as heresy, perversions of the true word of God. We read on. Their communication continued to state that all this having taken place, they parted in peace and having commended each other with tears and the kiss of love into the keeping of the Lord, the brethren journeyed back to Thessalonica, one of them who was a tailor by trade, left his shears as a memento in the church of Pazron. This history is not only known to me, but is generally known not only in Moravia, but also in the Upper Palatine. Now, we today would probably look at this, and uh, they, they, had a, they observed the Lord's Supper together. It's not necessarily something today that most of our churches would approve of. Uh, some have an open communion, and that is all of the faith as they're there would do it. 
But most of us do uh, observe a, what we call a closed communion or closed communion. Only the local body participates in it. But that alone, that by itself, does not negate this great importance that these people, that they bore witness, that they had the same faith, same observances, that go all the way back to the apostles. And we do finally believe that includes a believer's baptism. That includes Jesus Christ being the head of the true local church system which he established himself. And that the word of God is that final authority by which we do all things. Of these things, Jacob Mooring of Huston gives this account. Thus we have information that even in the present day there are brethren and Christians at Thessalonica who agree with the Mennonites in all articles of religion, also in the baptism, two of whom were yet in the time of our fathers with the brethren in Moravia and then also in the Netherlands and communed with the brethren who expressly declared that they still preserved in good condition at Thessalonica the original the originals of St. Paul's two epistles to, Thessal to the Thessalonians. Likewise that many of their brethren were still living scattered here and there in Ethiopia, Greece and other oriental countries as well as other Christians who like them were preserved by God and remained in some do remained in the same doctrine and the true practice of baptism constantly from the beginning of the apostles to this time up from Baptist history page 739 is where you can find that at that portion right there it states so even this book here it again Martyr's Mirror has stuff that is from other sources and it gives you those sources D. Weiss comes quotes from the Necrophos Callistus that in Thessalonia baptism was administered only at Easter on which account many died without baptism. Again, they did not believe baptism was necessary for salvation. And history proves that here. This harmonizes quite well with the foregoing, namely that the Thessalonian churches were not accustomed or at least did not deem it necessary to be baptized, did not necessary, deem it necessary to baptize infants, seeing they waited with them a whole year. On the other hand, those who considered infant baptism necessary frequently dare not post, postpone it one month, one week, yea, sometimes not even one day, on account of the uncertainty of the infant's life. Indeed, that was the argument for it. Oh, they might die. And they die without baptism. Uh, and they, and they, can't, you know, they can't be saved then. Well, that's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Oh, that's all he said, suffer little children come unto me. And that's not what he was referring to at all. Not referring to baptism at all, my friends. But there at that point, in that moment in time when he was there, and those children wanted to come unto him, and some of the apostles were trying to stop him, they said, I'll suffer them to come unto me. And that childlike faith that those children have, my friends, is the kind of faith we need to have in our Lord. To trust Him. Above all other things, trust Him that He will watch over and provide for us even as He has the saints throughout the ages. And our trust is not that He'll preserve this old sinful life of ours, but that when our life is at an end, we know we're going to be with the Lord. And that He is our Savior. And that our, save, our salvation is sure and steadfast. Goes on to read, we're going to read here, it says, But that the Thessalonian churches had to the custom of baptizing only on Easter, that is, once a year, came as may be inferred, because they deemed it, it necessary first to instruct the persons for a long time, almost a year, and to teach them the faith before they might be baptized, as has been shown from the, and it gives a book here for the year 1124. 
and uh, but and of course today uh, we don't uh, and I would have to argue this that you can't prove from the Word of God that they delayed baptism you can't prove that and even at that point it was unnecessary no, no need to delay baptism if they are able to profess faith if they believe and they profess faith I guess you might say they wanted to make sure that they were professing faith, that they truly were believing. But we do generally today, anyone that comes forward professing faith, it says they're saved, says they've been saved, and they're trusting in the Lord. We do baptize them in a short time, not necessarily that very day, but uh, within a short period of time they are baptized. We go on to read here, and then the year 15 and 58, and we might point out here at this point, last time I think it took us three videos to get through the beginning of the 15th century. And this here may take four. There's a lot of information for this century to give to you. And again, it does not cover all that is available in that book, Mars Mirror. Uh, 1558. At this time, a God-fearing and pious hero of Jesus Christ named Thomas von Liebrich made a most excellent and explicit confession of holy baptism, as also is ref a refresh, refreshing of the opponents. And I know I'm not saying that word right, but uh, sometimes this mind of mine is a, a hindrance to me. But uh, friends, uh, we will have this information on there. Uh, sometimes I don't think to add it all right away because you can only get so, uh, I think it's like 5,000 letters. It's all you can get in the main text for the YouTube video. And if it goes beyond it, which quite often it does, and it may be, I may not uh, right away remember to add the extra on there once I post it. But we do try, uh, as soon as we do, we get it up there. So you might want to check back if you want to see the rest of the reading. If I haven't posted yet, we will eventually. Uh, so... Continuing on here, it said, Made most excellent and explicit confession of holy baptism, as also is ref refreshing of the opponents. And I know that's uh, just not coming out. Right? Which he delivered to the lords of Koenig, where he was imprisoned for the faith. It reads as follows. I believe and confess that there is a Christian baptism which must take place externally and internally, internally by the Holy Ghost and with fire, in, that's internally, externally with water, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And we, you know, he's talking about being saved first. You must be saved and the Holy Spirit take up its abode within you first. And then you receive the external baptism. It goes on to say, internal baptism is imparted by... Christ to the penitent as John the Baptist said I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance but he that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes I am not worthy to bear he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire and of course his quotation of that text is not necessarily what we recognize today uh, but uh, we do know what he's referring to in Matthew chapter 3 11 and Mark chapter 1 verse 8 that's where that relates to uh, Christ confirms these words when he says to his disciples that they should not depart from Jerusalem but wait for the promise of the Father which saith he ye have heard of me for John truly baptized with water but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence and this promise was for, fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 4 uh, and 5, and Acts cha and, uh, chapter 2, etc., where it spoke of these things. And uh, again, that, ba that baptism was not the point of their salvation. And they'd already, they already had the Holy Ghost. You can read even before the book of Acts starts, where Jesus Christ himself breathes on them and says, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. But there's a distinction made in this, and we've spoke about it before. But on that day of Pentecost, 
and it relates back to the begin the, the days when they created the tabernacle, the temple, and when those were prepared, when the uh, God's Spirit first came down and dwelt in them, that those temples were filled up. Those places of worship were filled up with the Holy Spirit of God to where that the ones there couldn't do anything. And there's a distinction, my friends. To whereas there was a temple that the Spirit of God dwelt in in the midst of the people, but now the Holy Spirit of God dwells in the people themselves, our bodies being the temple of God. The Holy Spirit's dwelling in us. And it's leading us unto all truth that we might glorify God. We move on here while we still have some time. In the year of 15 and 69, now when the Papists sat in such darkness that they immediately put to death those who, having been baptized in infancy, were when er, arriving at riper years and understanding, baptized upon faith, in other words, they were rebaptized after they came to an uh, age of understanding, an uh, age of uh, knowing and understanding the things of God more properly, a God-fearing teacher of the church of Jesus Christ named Jacob D. Rohr did nevertheless not hesitate to make, and with regard to this matter, a solitary and good confession right in his bonds and imprisonment at Burgess, Burgess Burgess, in Flanders, the following words. Furthermore, I confess a Christian baptism, according to the tenor of the word of God, as Christ commanded his apostles, saying, Go, teach all nations, baptizing them. They were to go and teach, all, preach the word of God unto all nations. That is, the commission to the church would go and pre preach the word of God unto everyone. And those then that believe, receive the word of God with gladness in their hearts, we then are to baptize them. And then, my friends, we're to teach them the all things of God. And not only teach them the things of God, but we're to teach them to observe those things and to keep those things and to pass them on to the next generations that are coming on. And this it has been done so since the days of the first church of Jerusalem. And my friends, that's why we're here today. Believers and believers' baptism. Believers in a local visible church system which has only Jesus Christ as, it he as its head. No other earthly institution of men has any authority over us as the churches of the Lord. And the Word of God, my friends, is the final authority that we look to for all things in faith and practice and worship unto God. 1572, well, we might, well, I'm not going to try to squeeze this in. We're down to a minute, it looks like, here, maybe a little more. Friends, this history we're giving you may not be appreciated, but I mean, there's many that argue against this history. They don't want to believe this history. Because if they accept this history, then they have to acknowledge the church systems that they've been brought up in, which they're a part of, don't have any truth in them, if, uh, if in little truth of any, and in truth they have no authority because they are not of the, of the line of true churches which held to the truth and held to believers' baptism and uphold the word of God, but they trace themselves back into Catholicism which fell from the truth and apostatized itself, made itself the seat of Satan which the Antichrist will set upon when he comes. Friends, we're out of time, and I pray God bless and keep you until we meet again.